This is Alexander Newton, and I'll be speaking about tuning the signaling output of protein kinase C. Protein kinase Cs are a family of enzymes that transduce signals that result in lipid hydrolysis. There are nine isozymes grouped into three families, and they share the same architecture. I'm going to talk first about the conventional protein kinase Cs, which are regulated by both diacyglycerol and calcium. All the protein kinase C family members have a kinase domain at the carboxy terminal half that does the chemistry, and a regulatory moiety that has the lipid second messenger or calcium sensing modules. In the case of conventional protein kinase Cs, they have tandem C1A, C1B domains that are the diacyglycerol sensor, and a C2 domain that binds calcium, and this allows it to bind to the plasma membrane. The structures of these modules are shown below. They also have, shown in green, a small peptide segment that acts as an autoinhibitory pseudosubstrate segment. The novel protein kinase Cs differ in that their C2 domain does not bind calcium. However, their C1 domains bind diacyglycerol with two orders of magnitude higher affinity, and thus they only need one second messenger, diacyglycerol, for activation. The atypical protein kinase Cs have a C1 domain that is unable to bind diacylglycerol, and so they are regulated by neither diacylglycerol nor calcium. I should note that the ability of novel protein kinase Cs to bind diacylglycerol with this 100-fold higher affinity is because they have a C1B domain that has a tryptophan at a key residue, and this tryptophan, when it's present as a tryptophan, allows high affinity binding present as a tyrosine is much lower affinity binding. Protein kinase C isoforms are also modified by phosphorylation at three conserved sites in the primary sequence of the kinase domain, and where they are in the 3D structure is shown in the model before, underneath. This phosphorylation is constitutive, and it's important to prime or mature protein kinase C into a catalytically competent enzyme that is then ready to respond to second messengers. Protein kinase C output is exquisitely tuned, and this is important for normal homeostasis. If there's too much activity of protein kinase C or too little activity, that results in pathophysiological states. Mounting evidence suggests that not enough protein kinase C activity results in cancer, and too much protein kinase C activity results in degenerative diseases. So the output of protein kinase C is controlled by phosphorylation, which is constitutive, it's present, it is required to make a catalytically competent protein kinase C and required for the stability of the enzyme. It is also acutely regulated by second messengers, which are the on-off switches for catalytic activity. And lastly, it's controlled by location, which positions protein kinase C near its substrates. Well, we found that protein kinase C that has not been matured by phosphorylation translocates to membranes much faster than the matured protein kinase C. And in this experiment, we've taken a protein kinase C that cannot be primed by phosphorylation, and this will be the red construct, and a wild-type protein kinase C transfected them into the same cell and monitored where they go upon activation by four-ball esters and how quickly they go there. So I'll start the movie now, and the unprimed protein kinase C in RFP, after five and a half minutes, has translocated to the membrane whereas the wild-type enzyme still remains primarily in the cytosol. If I now continue the movie, we find that the wild-type enzyme will eventually go to the membrane. We can quantify these data, and the wild-type enzyme translocates to the membrane in response to four-ball esters with a half-time of approximately three minutes. If we now look at the catalytically incompetent enzymes that cannot be processed, there are three different ways that we have used to inactivate protein IC, and all of these constructs translocate to membranes about 10 times more quickly than the processed phosphorylated wild-type enzyme. Well, if we look at the rate of translocation of just the isolated C1A, C1B domain, we find that that translocates also very rapidly to the membrane. So this suggests then that in the unprimed protein IC where we have this rapid membrane translocation, our C1A and C1B domains are fully exposed, whereas in the mature enzyme, there has been some conformational change which masks these domains, and so we have slower translocation. We've looked at this conformational rearrangement by one other way, and that is by making kinamelian, a conformational sensor that has CFP and YFP flanking the amino and carboxy ends of the kinase. 
If we look at this, transfect cells with a catalytically inactive protein IC so that it can never be primed, we find low FRET. If we now transfect in instead a wild-type enzyme and we have not activated it, it's present primarily in the cytosol and we have higher FRET, so the C and N termini have come closer together. If we now add four ball esters to activate this enzyme, it translocates to the membrane and we have even greater FRET. And now, if we downregulate protein IC by prolonged treatment with four ball esters, which will result in the dephosphorylation of protein IC, we go back to having low FRET indicating that our amino and carboxy termini are far apart in the unprimed enzyme and far apart when the enzyme has then been dephosphorylated. Putting this all together, our model is that protein IC, when it's newly synthesized, associates with the membrane in an open conformation in which the C1A and C1B domains are fully exposed. It then undergoes these intramolecular conformational changes that are triggered by the phosphorylation events that occur upon the priming of the enzyme. This intramolecular conformational change also results in the pseudosubstrate entering the active site and blocking catalytic activity. This form of the enzyme is catalytically competent but it will not be active until we have second messengers present. So in response to signals that result in lipid hydrolysis, the calcium that is generated will bind to the C2 domain and recruit protein IC to the plasma membrane where the C2 domain specifically also recognizes PIP2. At the membrane, the enzyme is then able to find its membrane embedded ligand, diacylglycerol, and that binding of diacylglycerol then releases the pseudosubstrate and now, from our FRET experiments, we know that the C and N termini are much closer together, the enzyme is active, and it does downstream signaling. This conformation of protein IC is very sensitive to dephosphorylation, so it can be dephosphorylated, and it now regains this wide open conformation that the newly synthesized and unprimed protein kinase C has. So, what this shows is that there are these intramolecular conformational changes that optimize the dynamic range of protein IC signaling. And what I mean by that is that in this mature form of protein IC, shown at the bottom left of the slide, it's in a conformation where the accessibility of the C1 domains to diacylglycerol has been masked, and thus we do not have any basal signaling. So by tuning the affinity of this C1 domain, we now have this inability to bind diacylglycerol in this inactive conformation, but now when we recruit it to the membrane and diacylglycerol is there, we have this maximal range, full dynamic range of signaling. Had we not had these intramolecular conformational changes, protein high C would have very high basal signaling. So one of the things I'd like to convey today is maintaining the level of protein high C signaling output is essential for homeostasis, and there are many ways to do that, but here we have shown that intramolecular conformational changes tune the diacylglycerol sensor for optimal signaling, and I would like to thank you for your attention.